This episode is sponsored by Girls Can Crate. Girls Can Crate is a unique subscription box inspiring girls to believe that they can be and do anything. How do they do it? Like us, Girls Can Crate believes that real women make the best heroes. And every month they deliver them to your doorstep. This episode is brought to you by our patrons, Chantelle Oliver and Leanne Christiansen. If you'd like to become a patron and help support our women's history work, visit our website at whatsyournamepodcast.com and click donate. Hi, Katie. Hi, Olivia. So if you think back to our episode on Margaret Molly Brown, we had a long discussion in that episode about whether it was better to be forgotten right or misremembered yeah and you chose forgotten right yeah you actively want to be forgotten of course (laughs) and i think that's a really interesting question and and way of looking at the past yeah i guess so a couple of our listeners have brought that up to me after the fact it must be a question we all ask ourselves or something yeah i mean it's definitely one that has stuck with me as i'm working on other stories and Mm. other episodes But my question is, what happens when you're both? What if someone were to be erased while they were famous and misremembered as their life is happening? I don't get it. (laughs) I think that's the best way to explain what happened to the woman that we're going to be talking about today. Hmm. Her name is Carolyn Cassidy. And the very first line in her Wikipedia entry is that she is associated with the Beat Generation through her relationships with Ah. Neil Cassidy, Jack Kerouac. Classic. So, uh, how much do you know about the Beat Generation, the Beat Writers? Well, all those that are still living, I have met. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I forgot. (laughs) Maybe 10 years ago in grad school, I was the grad assistant I was basically like the gopher for Hmm. a beat conference and we brought in all the living famous beat poets and I was like shuttling them around everywhere and getting them their coffee (laughs) and all that kind of stuff so listeners who might not know who we're talking about the beat generation are the group of writers mostly in the 50s who were known for works like Jack Kerouac's on the road and they were interested in shaking up the literary conventions and also sort of the cultural conventions of life they're associated with a lot of drugs a lot of sex and changing the rules of society kind of work i'm olivia mickle and i'm katie nelson and this is what's her name fascinating women you've never heard of so this episode is gonna be a little unusual cool Because I had the unique so far in this podcast opportunity of talking to our subject's daughter, Kathy Cassidy. Cool. About her mother. And our other guest is Josette Lorg. And Josette also helped me interview Kathy Cassidy and then also gave me an interview on her own. My name is Josette Lorg and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Colorado Boulder in English. One part of my research focus is the beat generation, particularly beat women. So I'm interested in a group of women who are part of the beat generation, but haven't really been talked about as writers because they're not necessarily authors or weren't published. I was wondering what you think of your mother being known as a muse. How do you feel about that term? I think it's meant to be complimentary, and she was an inspiration, of course, to Jack. You know, he wrote uh, a lot of characters based on mom. And her relationship with dad, of course, was very (laughs) multi-leveled and troublesome at times. And so she had mixed emotions all the time about dad and his cronies and being involved with them and all the antics and all the havoc they were wreaking in her life. So when she was involved for those 20 years with these guys and and considered part of them and a big part of them, I think she was more than a muse, you know, she was more than a muse. 
I remember the philosophical conversations they would have. Her intellectual connection was what she really valued with these guys. And she really was very much, she was very much a seeker and a, you know, that word term is used in a different context now, but she, she was so curious and so was dad, you know, all the conversations about the meaning of life and that would go on forever. And all the guys would have those conversations and she was in there with them. And I love that she calls them the guys. And so that's how I'm going to be referring to the male beat writers for the rest of this episode. Okay, cool. So I, I want to unpack this word a little bit. What is a muse to you? Uh, someone who inspires the work of a great artist. Like a great artist depends heavily on that person and can't produce their greatness without this Inspiration. Inspiring the great work of this artist, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. I find it really condescending when people are referred to as a muse mm -hmm. for another artist, usually. Right. Usually I just assume it means, oh, somebody who got overshadowed or right. devalued <laughs> by the person that they hung out with. Right. But they but, got a thank you. Yeah. Dedicated to. Yeah. They get a nod. She inspired my deep emotions that yes. made this art possible. <laughs> So let me ask you this. Let's let's access your ancient history, mm -hmm. Professor Brain, here for a second. <laughs> what is a muse? Oh, well, the three muses controlled human destinies. They were in charge of everything. And if an artist is crediting a muse... Mm, divinity has intervened. They're goddesses. Exactly. <laughs> the muse is not an inspiration. Yeah. The muse is the, the creator. Source, right. And the poet is the conduit. Right. The poet is the, the body yeah. through which the muses' creations happen. Mm. I think that is a much better way of framing what Carolyn Cassidy was in the Beat Generation. Because if we look at it that way, I fully agree. She absolutely was a muse. And so that's why I feel comfortable calling this episode the muse. She is an actual muse, a creative force who's face is obscured. Cool. She wanted people to know about her life and her background. It was so opposite to dad's and she was raised with culture and arts and, you know, educated and she wanted people to know that she was not just some dumb blonde. She had a lot to offer. She went on to attend an art school and design school in New York City. She earned a degree in Stanislavski drama there from a, a really prestigious program. She was very involved in the theater and art scene there. While she was studying art there, she actually used to go and do medical illustration during the cadaver dissection. So she's there drawing the anatomy, studying the anatomy and drawing the bodies in the cadaver dissections hmm. while they're going on. Wow. We have a great picture of her sitting there in the cadaver lab doing this medical illustration. Every picture you will see of her, she is put together and fashionable. And mm. she is one of those who is just always so she never has a hair out of place. And so she here she is sitting here doing medical dissections and she looks like a fashion model. <laughs> Obviously very dedicated and serious to this work that she's doing. And yet she would reminisce that while she was doing this work, the male medical students would tease her by throwing eyeballs at her while oh she was trying to gosh. do this medical illustration. Wow. And I think <laughs> that that's a pretty good encapsulation of what a lot of her life seems to have been, being the grown-up who ah. is put together and pursuing her work with seriousness while the guys are wreaking havoc all around <laughs> So when she was finished with her degree there, she moved to Denver to attend Denver University, DU, uh, to get a master's degree in theater arts, focusing it especially in design, costume design. And it was while she was there living in Denver and attending Denver University that she is introduced to Neil Cassidy. Where are the beat writers 
in our cultural imagination, where are the beats? Ah, well, one of my colleagues actually teaches a study abroad course every year that is about the beat generation. Ah. And they go to San Francisco. Exactly. <laughs> San Francisco, now Jack Kerouac yep. Boulevard. That's it. You know, there are a few locations that are really tied with the beat generation. There's New York, there's Denver, and there's San Francisco. Mm-hmm. But largely, the whole idea, the mythology of the beats is on the road, right? It's literally on the oh, road. Yeah. These are, it's about movement. It's about travel. It's about being in between spaces. Yeah. And Josette Lorig has a really interesting take on how the beat women feature into that mythology. Hmm. The beat legend sort of starts with Joan Vollmer and Edie Parker. Joan Vollmer becomes the common law wife of William Burroughs. And for those who might not know, is shot in the head by William Burroughs Hmm. uh, some years later. And then Edie Parker is the first wife of Jack Kerouac. Hmm. So the two of them are students at Columbia, and they have an apartment, and it's their apartment, which is Joan Vollmer's apartment, that becomes sort of like a salon. And that's where you have these early members of the Beat Generation getting together and sharing ideas. So like Joan Vollmer and Edie Parker, Carolyn Cassidy is also tied to geography in interesting ways. It's her who moves to San Francisco. So really, it's it's Carolyn Cassidy who takes the beats to San Francisco. So the way that places like New York or San Francisco that are so associated with these men are really anchored by women and really associated with these women in particular who aren't actually given a lot of credit for their artistry. And it's yet another example of the ways that Carolyn Cassidy's life is rewritten while it's happening. After an incident when she somewhat famously found Jack Kerouac and Neil and Neil's first wife, Luann Henderson, all in bed together, she leaves and moves to California to take a job doing costume design in L.A. While she's waiting for that job to start, she goes to San Francisco to stay with her sister. And when Neil follows her, apologetic, and Jack follows Neil, Ah. the beats end up centered in San Francisco. It's Carolyn Cassidy's ambition, Carolyn Cassidy's art, that brings the beats to Mm. the place that is centered around them. So the entire mythology is still always centered around these men moving around, but it is the women who have brought them there. Wow. So I become really interested in the way that women are both a catalyst and an anchor for this movement and also these places that are so tied to men. So after Neil and Jack follow Carolyn to San Francisco, he receives an annulment of his first marriage, and Neil and Carolyn get married. Neil Cassidy is arrested for selling drugs. It's kind of a bogus charge. He gives some marijuana to some undercover agents, and then they arrest him. Mm. But he goes to jail for two years. (laughs) Wow. And Carolyn Cassidy did such a good job of shielding the children from the knowledge of what was happening that they didn't realize he was in jail. Wow. She was living a life of a mom and wife, and at least when she was involved with the guys, it was a routine life. You know, she worked full time, she tried to keep food on the table, and she managed so well that when, when Dad went to prison, my siblings and I still look at each other and shake our heads and say, how did we not know he was gone for two years? <laughs> you know? We had no idea. I mean, this shows you how much he was gone on the railroad, of course. He was gone most of the time. But but for two years, we didn't see him. And we just, it was life as usual. You know, except for being on welfare and getting the welfare food and stuff. And used things at Christmas. I remember, you know, we weren't happy about that. But I didn't know the reason. So she managed pretty well to keep us as normal as possible in that environment. Wow. The Mm. amount of emotional labor that goes into giving children a semblance of a normal life among the Beat Generation is really astonishing to me. You know, it's just normal kid stuff most of the time. It was tough on her to balance and juggle all this. I did 
feel her depression and it did affect us, of course. She couldn't be emotionally there for us. And so it, you know, she did all she could. She did the best that she could under the circumstances. It was really tough on her. And she doesn't get credit for that either, for maintaining that home life. Her art, of course, was, it was just a given. We grew up with it and she always had uh, portraits she would do on commission. And so there was always a stranger in our living room and the house always smelled like oils. It was before acrylics. You know, she designed all the costumes for our ballet school when we were young. She did all the sets and the makeup and the costumes for ballet school. And so the family room was covered in tool and fabric and the premier dancers costumes mom would make and then she would put together uh, costume designs with fabric swatches for the parents then she had a little drawing of uh, a face and showed one half of how the parents could make up the kid so her artwork was everywhere and she didn't just do painting or drawing or she had all these costumes and scenery sets all over the house and and we just, just took it for granted, unfortunately. <laughs> Art was just part of our lives, and we were very fortunate that she became the art director for the uh, San Jose Light Opera Company and the drama department of the Santa Clara University. And so we had the opportunity to go to all these beautiful uh, light opera performances and see all the Shakespeare plays and Besides doing our own, we were on stage a couple of times a year, you know, doing our own productions. I didn't realize when I was young that she had a degree in drama, in Stanislavski drama. You know, she was always behind the scenes when we were kids. This is masterwork art yeah. that she's making in a very domestic context. Mm. She creates incredible gardens. She created a zodiac garden. Yeah in the field behind their house in California that was, it was a vegetable garden designed around astrology charts yeah. and the, this amazing work of art that is the vegetable garden. Mm. Let's pause for just a second to thank our sponsor, Girls Can Crate. Girls Can Crate is a unique subscription box inspiring girls to believe that they can be and do anything. Every crate features an inspiring woman and her own unique story of why she's awesome, a 28-page activity book, plus everything you would need to complete two or three hands-on team activities and more. And for our listeners, if you go to girlscancrate.com, C-R-A-T-E dot com, and use the code HERNAME, all caps, you'll get 20% off your first month's crate on any subscription. It's designed for kids, but honestly, I think it's fun for adults. I have had many moments of awe based on these subscription box for children. Check them out now at girlscancrate, C-R-A-T-E dot com. And when you order, make sure you use the coupon code HERNAME, all caps, so that they know we sent you. I think the best example of Carolyn Cassidy's art being unrecognized are that the, the most iconic photos of Jack Kerouac and Neil Cassidy, the really most famous photographs that people probably think of when they think of the Beat Poets, those are Carolyn Cassidy's photos. They very rarely get credit to her. She almost never received payment when people would use them. Wow. And this isn't just, you know, people using photos in their personal work. These are on, on book covers from major publishers. <laughs> and Josette Laurie shared this great story. There was a major publisher's booth at a convention that Carolyn Cassidy was attending. They had a new edition of some of Jack Kerouac's work and her photograph was on the cover of this book. Wow. And she just walked up to the booth. I mean, good for her. She walked up and said, that's my photo. Did you pay me for that? <laughs> and handed them the form so that they could pay her for the photograph they were using. Her work is famous and also completely disconnected from her as the person who created it. That aspect really just showed how, how much has really been taken away from her, even just that her photos have been disassociated from her completely. That was her lifelong struggle 
was to have recognition of her work, whether it was her creation or her photos. Her photos were used all over without permission. She spends almost her entire life orbiting unwillingly around Neil Cassidy's legacy. Mm. That she is asked to speak about it. She's asked to write about it. She's asked relentless, endless questions mm. about the guys. She got really tired of being asked the same questions. She said that's why she wrote Off the Road. She'd say, read my book. And every time the media would ask her the same questions in interviews, so we finally got her a shirt that said, read my book. <laughs> <laughs> she wrote a memoir, Heartbeat, My Life with Jack and Neil, that is about those years <laughs> together. And when that was made into a movie, a pretty well-known movie at the time, she was asked to be a consultant on the movie. Mm -hmm. So she wrote her own screenplay for that movie. And she was hired to be a consultant, but she says, well, you know, they never listened to me, so I don't know why they did that. But that's the money she got to be able to go to Europe with. And so she finally got to go. That was a good thing that came out of the movie, but she was not a fan. She didn't like it. It is very strange. I mean, there's a character in Heartbeat that plays me. It was strange for me to see that, you know, and so I can imagine, oh, my goodness. But on the road, when that came out, we were invited by Vanity Fair to go to George Lucas's ranch to watch the screening of On the Road. But that was a trip. I thought Kirsten Dunst did a good job as well. I, I was slinking down in my seat. They did such a good job of bringing the vibe of that time, the energy of that time. You could feel the amphetamine-fueled lifestyle. And I was feeling a little, I've inherited mom's prude gene. And so <laughs> she has that side of her. So I was a little kind of embarrassed and shrinking down in my seat. But then um, Luann Henderson's daughter was a couple seats down from me. And I thought, oh, she must be doing the same. <laughs> I don't know what mom thought of the movie, but I could guess. <laughs> <laughs> This is the part that's really surreal for me. If, if we're thinking back to Margaret Brown, Margaret Brown never saw the unsinkable Molly Brown. Yeah. Right? She had her lived existence, and then later her story was changed. Mm -hmm. Carolyn Cassidy is a consultant yeah. on the film that rewrites her life. Wow. She's in real time watching her own identity be erased. Right. She must have lived a life that really drove home the power of myth-making in culture yeah. that we're less interested in the reality and more interested in the myth. Yeah, and well, and especially because one of her biggest frustrations was that in a similar way, the same thing is happening to the guys. They're being rewritten. Mm -hmm. They're also kind of writing it themselves. Jack Kerouac is literally rewriting his life as a fictional account. Mm -hmm. But the culture is rewriting the mythology of what the beats are yeah. and what it means. Yeah. And that she spends the rest of her life trying to say, this is not how they were. That's not even who they wanted to be. Mm -hmm. They weren't this story that you are making up. So she's constantly called in to testify as the eyewitness to the beats, to the guys, mm. to what happened. And then her testimony is consistently overruled. Yeah. All of the beat women are reduced to interchangeable parts. They don't have individual personalities. You need some woman around mm -hmm. to inspire your mind. Do you mean at the time? At the time and now, they get constantly interchanged with one another. Mm. Um, people will mistake who they're talking about or attribute information from one to another. Mm. A really, really stunning example of this is that in 1982 at Naropa University, where I teach, there was a three-day conference on Jack Kerouac that brought together all of the living Beat Generation figures and scholars and the Grateful Dead <laughs> gathered <laughs> in Boulder. And thanks to Naropa University for allowing us to use these audio files. So I played a little bit of audio from Carolyn Cassidy's panel at this conference for Josette Lorig. As Carolyn Cassidy is introduced, the moderator of the panel, he's assuming that this group of 
beat scholars won't know who Carolyn Cassidy is, first of all, which is bizarre. And then he decides to clarify who she is for the audience. As I remember, um, the first time I met Jack was Neil brought him to the University of Denver campus where I was a teaching assistant. To, to try to keep this a little straight for, for those of you who are trying to figure this out from, from the books, the names, uh, Carolyn Cassidy was Luann. No. 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 <laughs> no. I lost. Come on, Ivan. <laughs> I lost. Okay. Well, nobody was anybody. Actually, Kerouac used, made fiction out of uh, right. real people. So nobody is exactly <laughs> one to anybody. Go on, Carolyn. Wow. <laughs> um, wow. So I think, right, what's interesting is that, is that that's sort of indicative of the way that these women are all lumped together and they're just sort of interchangeable. Luann is the real name of Neil Cassidy's first wife. So he is not only confusing her with Neil Cassidy's first wife, uh-huh. he is also confusing her character in the book with the character and that person with the real name of Luann Henderson. <laughs> so all of her identities have been elided in one swoop. She is merely one of the appendages to Neil. It doesn't matter which one. Mm -hmm. And this happens over and over and over to her. The clearest way she's erased is the thing that made her famous. She is best known for being a character in On the Road and in Jack Kerouac's other books. Yeah. She is a fictional character in this book. And as she and Allen Ginsberg have pointed out, they're, th those are fictional characters roughly based on. That's not her. Mm -hmm. But the mythology is so strong that even her own identity is less important. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of the, the sexy lamp theory of film criticism? Uh, I guess not. No. <laughs> I think a lot of people are familiar with like the Bestial test. You know, is there a woman? Does she have a name? Does she speak? Oh, yeah. Um, my very favorite, just lowest possible bar test for women's involvement in a film is the sexy lamp theory. Could the female characters in this film be replaced with a sexy lamp without impacting the plot? <laughs> and it's really shocking how often the answer is yes. I think that's what our culture has done to these beat women, that these really powerful, important voices have been reduced to interchangeable sexy lamps mm -hmm. that inspire greatness in the men. So uh, Carolyn Cassidy's memoir is titled Off the Road, 20 Years with Neil Cassidy, Jack Kerouac, and Allen Ginsberg. And so something that I find really striking about the memoir is the way that Carolyn Cassidy talks about her relationships with all of Neil's girlfriends, Jack Kerouac's wives and girlfriends. The title of her book is 20 Years with Jack and Neil, but as Josette Lord points out, it's... 20 years with Jack and Neil, but then 50 years with the other women who were impacted by Jack and Neil. Ah. The way that she can convey feelings of jealousy and animosity, but also feelings of tenderness and solidarity with these women. So Carolyn Cassidy's memoir ends with a conversation that she has with Diana Hansen. Diana Hansen is Neil Cassidy's third wife, kind of. He married her while he was still married to Carolyn while Carolyn was pregnant with their second child. <laughs> so it's a complex relationship. I just think this is a really telling ending. So Neil has died, Jack has died. Um, it's 1969 and Diana calls Carolyn. She's settling in to watch a show and, and asking her to call later. She's busy. And so finally, she, she kind of loses it. She says, I let fly, stamped down ruthlessly, all my carefully constructed fences of redemptive behavior. Blast the woman. Will you shut up a minute? Don't you ever think of anything except what happened 20 years ago? 
And so at the end, we're kind of circling back to the title of the narrative, right, which is this focus on this 20 years and revealing that right, it's not just 20 years with Neil Allen and Jack. So then she goes on and says, and then a strange thing happened to me right in the heat of my rage. It was as though I heard a click somewhere inside me and with no pause or change in my angry tone, I suddenly loved her. I began to feel warm, melting, and joyous, and I listened to my words in awe. So it ends with this sort of conversation with these two women who had been basically adversaries for the last 20 years because of this man, loving each other, saying positive things to each other. And then the last line of the entire memoir is Diana saying she's going to bet on a horse at the Kentucky Derby for Carolyn. And Carolyn responds, this is the last, the last line of the memoir. Lovely put it on the third choice in memory of Neil. And I think that speaks to what Kathy's talking about, what we've been talking about. Not wanting to ever erase the Beat legacy, but to get out from under it and, and show that there's so much more than the mythology of these men and her relationship to them. That her life was greater than that, was, was bigger than that. After she died, her children found an incredible archive of work that she had done that they had no idea she was doing. It was such a, a treasure hunt, just a wealth of treasures and discoveries, and we're still discovering. And we didn't know she did all this extra writing. All we knew about was uh, Off the Road and Heartbeat while she was alive. But now we have novels and screenplays and her 550 page autobiography and poetry and I mean who knew and it's just beautiful and it's you know sad of course but better later than never I just want her recognized I think that's a thing that maybe most of us have encountered when you you meet someone that you've known after they die that you feel like you finally mm. understand them now in a way that you never did. And she sort of described it as a strange family reunion between mother and children of them rediscovering who she was and building these new relationships with her mm. after her death through her work. Wow. What a weird thing to be trying to uncover your mom's legacy from your dad's legacy. From your dad. The Cassidy family published a book written by Carolyn this year in 2018 titled Travel Tips for the Timid or What Guidebooks Never Tell. So it's about this trip that Carolyn took at the age of 56 with her daughter Jamie to Europe in 1979. So one of the things that seems really fascinating is that we have Off the Road, which is her memoir and in the title itself, it's indicating that she is not traveling, that she is not on the road, right? She is back at home. And then comparing it with this book, Travel Tips for the Timid, sort of seems to be Carolyn's chance to go on the road. And what's so interesting about this text is that it is multimodal and has all of these various dimensions. So it's both this travel narrative interspersed with diary entries, and then there's these various sketches that Carolyn draws of her and Jamie. And then the most fascinating part, I think, is that there is a digital scrapbook. So if you buy the book, you're given the password to this digitized scrapbook online, which is 162 pages, and it is just everything. So it's plane tickets, it's scraps of napkins, it's photos, it's maps. It's so it's just like an old school scrapbook? An old school scrapbook. The text itself is a really unique contribution to women's life writing. It's not so much, right, these fantastical stories of travel, you know, in the beat writing, but these very sort of mundane aspects of what it's like to travel and what it's like to be in a body. It's a lot of attention to food, lists of the meals that they ate, the hotels that they stayed in, attention to decor and textiles the fabrics of the blankets and towels that they used. I think one of my favorite examples of this kind of everyday life is the sketch that uh, Carolyn Cassidy has of the various toilets that they've encountered and the various ways that they flush. 
things that are so familiar, and then the defamiliarization of them through difference. It's a really fascinating book on its own, but it's also a really important artifact in what I think is a huge sea change in the way we look at what is worth studying, Mm. what is worthy of academic attention, what deserves to be archived or studied or spoken about. Cool. She's not just getting her own voice out there. By reclaiming new genres as worthy, Mm -hmm. she's breaking down barriers and making it possible for other women's voices to be valued. We've talked a lot about that you need a champion. You need someone to keep your legacy alive, to champion your work, to tell your story. Yeah. And Carolyn Cassidy's children are absolutely doing that. They're really dedicated to getting her legacy out from under the shadow of their father's legacy. Mm. But in many ways, she is also her own champion. Even when she's silenced... She's writing, she's creating art, she is forcing her voice into the world, even if it's in a back room until she dies. Mm. When they ruin her book Ah. in the film, she writes her own screenplay as a counter. Cool. She stakes her claim on, this is my story, Mm. and here is how it went. She is writing herself back in. The other takeaway, I think, from this for me is... That doing history is hard. <laughs> that originally, since I am here in Boulder, I intended for this episode to be a road trip. This is us on the road, tracking down the pieces of her story that are still here. Mm-hmm. I have been working on this episode for almost a year, <laughs> and she has been completely erased. When Carolyn Cassidy was studying at DU, She lived in a residence hotel called the Colburn. The Colburn is still there, and they make a big to-do at this bar about the fact that Neil Cassidy and maybe, probably, Jack Kerouac drank there once. (laughs) And there is no mention of Carolyn Cassidy, who lived in the building. Mm -hmm. She launched an entirely new department at the Denver Art Museum. She created their first theater arts department. I was really excited, thinking surely there are great records and we can go see what work she did. And when I contacted the Denver Art Museum, they said, oh, unfortunately, because of the war, the museum didn't have a building at that point, And they were just staging temporary exhibitions at different locations around Denver. The entire archive for the year that Carolyn Cassidy worked here is one typewritten sheet in a manila folder <laughs> that contains the titles of the exhibitions, and that is all. (laughs) Even the records at Denver University were destroyed in a fire. (laughs) That she has been just completely erased from the landscape. She's just gone, and it... So many of these episodes are inspiring. They're the stories of the happy accidental discovery, of look at this whole archive of this woman that we never knew about, or we finally found all of these things that we knew she existed. Mm -hmm. And it was a really sort of poignant and sad reminder to me that sometimes you just can't find people. Right. That there's nothing left of her here. That's why historians have to be led by their sources. What sources exist? And every story, every life is worth keeping an archive of and telling their story. Every (laughs) single individual should have their story saved. But you can't save every piece of every story Archives are limited. So maybe yeah. in the digital age, maybe now that things That's, can be digitalized. That is one thing I'm very excited yeah, about. I think future historians are going to be rolling in the sources. <laughs> or, as my archaeological background always leads me to say in fear, or the fact that we no longer have any physical records of anything mm-hmm. means that when the great crash comes oh. and technology goes away, we have literally nothing. Yeah. And that future archaeologists will say, isn't it interesting how people stopped taking pictures and writing books and writing letters and doing anything (laughs) all of a sudden? Yeah, slipped into a dark ages. (laughs) Isn't it fascinating? How can we find out what happened? I kind of hope that does happen. I am really afraid of that. Like, everything will be gone. Oh, yeah. You're afraid of it. I hope it happens. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds fun. How are you a historian who doesn't want sources? Why do you hate future historians? 
I'm a historian who loves a mystery and understands <laughs> that facts are slippery and mutable. <laughs> the Cassidy family, they're really trying to create an archive of all of these papers of Carolyn Cassidy's and make it something that scholars and students can really dig into all of this material that she has left behind. And so they're doing a fundraiser to try to raise the funds to create this archive. And we're, of course, going to link to that from the website. So if listeners are interested in contributing to that and in helping create this completely new archive of really interesting, groundbreaking, unusual work, that you can do that. We hope you know, mom's legacy can be appreciated as, as important as dad's. His legacy has is, is kind of been around for a while and it'll be continuing, but now I think it's, it's time for the women to emerge. We're hoping that mom and, and other women that, who are associated with the Beats can be recognized for their gifts and their accomplishments. So it's a start. We're beginning. Huge thanks to our guests, Kathy Cassidy and Josette Lorig. Thanks also to the Naropa University Archives. If you'd like to learn more about Carolyn Cassidy, find links to her books, see pictures, family photographs, as well as links to the fundraiser and Kathy Cassidy's website. Visit our website at whatsyournamepodcast.com. Music for this episode was provided by Mary Lou Williams and Jeff Kuno. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of photos each week. This episode is brought to you by our patrons, Chantelle Oliver and Leanne Christiansen. If you'd like to become a patron and help support our women's history work, visit our website at whatsyournamepodcast.com and click donate. Find lots of great prizes there, including our unique trading cards, cross-stitch patterns, stickers, and even get your own shout out in a future episode. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickel and Katie Nelson, and this episode was edited by Olivia Mickel. Hello, What's Her Name listeners. I'm Barry Max Day. And I'm Ben Vandeveld. And we'd love you to listen to Worst Foot Forward, our podcast all about failure. Each week, we are joined by a guest to discuss the world's worst something, from serial killer to monarch, sex scene to mythical creature. And along the way, we've discovered things like murderous game show contestants, pirates who plundered hats, February 30th, seagull wine, and the great detective, Herlock Sholmes. Subscribe to Worst Foot Forward on iTunes, Spotify, CastBox, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Check out our website, worstfootforwardpodcast.com, and join us for some fun-filled zero worship.